are listening to Ideas on Trapped with Toby Lawson. Hi folks and welcome to another episode of Ideas on Trapped podcast. My guest today is Derek Lowe and I asked him questions about everything I can think of in pharmaceutical research from the speed of the discovery of COVID vaccines, to the application of mRNA to other diseases, and the general biological complexity of drugs development, especially in chronic illnesses. Derek is a medicinal chemist working in preclinical drug discovery in the pharmaceutical industry with over 30 years of experience. He is also one of the leading voices in the industry as he was one of the first people to start writing publicly from inside the pharmaceutical industry. I greatly enjoyed having this conversation with him, and I hope you do too. Ideas on Trap is sponsored by iInvest. iInvest is Nigeria's foremost digital platform for trading financial products like treasury bills, fixed deposit notes, commercial papers, euro bonds, and many more. It is the leading financial services marketplace gives you access to investment opportunities from various financial services providers within a single secure platform. Download the iInvest app on your Google Play Store or iOS App Store today and start investing at your convenience from anywhere in the world. Terms and conditions apply. And now, let's listen to the podcast. the last year and a half, the pandemic has been the biggest news in the world, right? right. But right. now we have vaccines built on mRNA research. When the pandemic was really raging, a lot of predictions were saying yeah. that the timeline for vaccine development and deployment is going to be fast. And that was responsible for some of the measures that countries were taking in preventing the spread. You know, right. but we had vaccines, say like a year after, or probably even less than that. Right. Why did that happen so quickly? Oh no, that's a, that's a really good question. And I think there are several reasons. One of them is, is that you mentioned the mRNA vaccines, and those were some of the ones that came up the quickest those actually seem to have a shorter timeline to development because you don't have to go to the trouble of culturing cells. Growing cells on an industrial scale is is a very tricky business. You don't have to go to that trouble and you pick out what part of the virus you want to induce immunity to and you can go straight to the RNA sequence and just read that off. Now, there's two things that made this faster than it would have been. One of them is the SARS epidemic in 2003, and then the the Middle East one, the MERS epidemic a couple of years later. Those coronaviruses are pretty similar to the one we're dealing with now, and a lot of research was done on them, trying to figure out how they replicate, what their proteins are like, their life cycle, and how you could come up with a vaccine. So we already had done a lot of the early work before, and a lot of the lessons from that we could immediately use. The second thing is, is that people had been working on mRNA vaccines and the adenovirus vaccines for years and years. So we had a lot of the basic work already done, and we'd made a lot of the mistakes already. We were very lucky, very lucky with both of those, that we knew more about this virus and that we knew so much about these new vaccine technologies. You talked about luck. Many people will not acknowledge that because Mm -hmm. the way public opinion sort of swings about this news is funny. So when the vaccines came out, there were also people, which is my next question, there were people who were saying that if not for the obsolete regulations that we have with the institutions like the FDA and co, that we could even have had these vaccines a lot quicker than we did. Mm. How, how true is that? Yeah, I've heard that one a lot. And it's, it's funny because 
I have a lot of sympathy for the FDA and the EMA and the other regulatory authorities because they really can't win. Either they're slowing everything down or they're doing everything too fast. There's nothing in between. You never hear them say, you know, I think that drug was just about the right time, just about the right speed. No, it's always too slow or too fast. And even with the vaccines, you have a lot of people who are refusing to take them because they say, oh, no, no, this was too fast. This thing hasn't been studied enough. This is still an experiment. I'm not going to be part of the experiment. Actually, they are part of the experiment. They're part of the control group. They just don't realize it. But as far as being too slow, I don't know. This was still the all-time speed record for getting a new vaccine out, like we were just talking about. I suppose you could have shaved a little bit off, but I don't see how it could be run much faster. We don't know enough about immunology to really be sure about something until it's gone into a lot of people. So with all of these vaccines, you look at their trials and they've gone into tens of thousands of volunteers and you watch them for months. I don't think there's any way we can shorten that. We can't predict it or simulate it or model it. So you're going to be faced with that time no matter what. And given the fact that we got off the ground really fast in the mRNA and adenoviruses and the trials started pretty quickly, you might have done it a couple of months faster, but I don't think any faster than that. Now we're seeing mRNA research and vaccine development being applied to other diseases like malaria. Uh, there was news about an HIV vaccine also yeah. using mRNA technology mm -hmm. for a vaccine. So why is COVID, or should I say this moment, sort of like the eureka moment for the development of vaccines in those other areas? So like, why didn't we have an mRNA vaccine for HIV five years ago or 10 years ago? People were working on one five and 10 years ago. That's the answer. Mm -hmm. A lot of the public doesn't realize this, but the mRNA vaccines have been worked on for about 20 to 25 years now. And what really sped things up was the need to have something quickly and the need to get a number of different vaccines against the same disease all at the same time. Suddenly it was like, okay, we can finally get this off the ground. Now, we have the reason to set up a big trial with 20, 30, 40,000 people. Whereas the mRNA vaccines that people were working on before, HIV was one, but HIV is very, very hard. We're extremely lucky that the coronavirus responds to vaccine technology the way it does. Just this morning, Johnson & Johnson, you know, they have a vaccine out for corona. They have an adenovirus vaccine. Now, just this morning, they announced that their adenovirus vaccine for HIV has failed. Hmm. So it may be that the mRNA vaccines are going to fail, too. But I hope not. I hope something works. But the mRNA vaccines and the adenovirus vaccines, they have been in the works for years. What happened was the pandemic just accelerated everything. So, OK, you know, that trial that we were thinking about doing in flu or that trial against RSV or maybe that trial where we we're going to be the third or fourth measles vaccine, we're going to scrap all that and we're going to go all in on Corona. You sort of hinted at my next question, which is, uh, was this also due to the fact that the pandemic was truly global in the real sense? And hence, we were able to get the political response that could accelerate funding, concentrate all the research efforts, you know, yeah. the, the warlike response that yeah. was seen globally to this. Was that also why we saw this quick response? Yeah. I'm sure that helped because, you know, you're right. This has been a problem for every country in the world. So you look at it and you say, all right, if we're ever going to pull out all the stops and throw everything we have, this is the time. Because this is not just a disease that's hitting one country. I mean, SARS, people were worried it might do this, but, but it really didn't spread as much, thank God. MERS only confined itself to a few Middle Eastern countries, and it was not as easy to catch. So that one didn't take off. This one, though, obviously, it's hitting every country. And you're right. That's what really got everyone moving, because it was like, OK, if you're going to build all this technology, 
if you're going to build the manufacturing plants, if you're going to take up all of the vial filling and capping equipment there is in the world, this is the time to do it. Nothing else would have had the same urgency. You're right. Let's move on from COVID a bit. Okay. One issue you've greatly explored on your blog, which I read religiously over the years, is the role of technology in drugs and pharmaceutical research. And I mean, down the years, we've seen companies like IBM with the Watson, Google oh, yeah. with AlphaFold. What are your general impressions about this? developments, are they going to be serious game changers or yeah. it's all Silicon Valley hype? You know, there's some of each. I like to tell people that I'm a, a long-term optimist about these things, but I'm a short-term, well, maybe a short-term pessimist, but definitely a short-term skeptic. I have been now doing drug research since 1989, so 32 years coming up. And many times I've had people tell me, oh, we can now do this molecular modeling better than ever before. You don't have to make hundreds or thousands of new compounds and test them every time. We can actually model which compound is going to fit into which protein. And we can tell you that has never worked. We still can't do that. 32 years after I first heard people telling me that they're ready to do that, we still can't. At the same time, there's no reason why we can't. There's no physical law. There's no mathematics. There's nothing that's keeping us from being able to do that. It's just a lot harder than it looked. And the same with um, protein folding and the, the stuff like IBM's Watson, the artificial intelligence. It's not that it can't be done. It's just a lot harder than it looks. IBM, for example, got rid of their Watson for drug discovery platform because it just did not live up to expectations. It, it wasn't useful. But at the same time, we are using some AI, especially for analyzing images of cells and images of tissue. And that's actually starting to work pretty well. So if you pick the right problem, you can get it to work now. And as we learn more about it, we're going to be able to get this to work for more things. But if someone walks into my office tomorrow and says, we got it solved, here, buy this great technology from us. I'm going to keep my hand in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I asked that question because you also talk about chronic illnesses like Alzheimer's, uh, oh, yes. cancer, MS, and the serious challenge of actually developing drugs to treat, let alone cure some of these diseases. <laughs> And critics who are maybe techno-optimists are convinced that these diseases or the cure to these diseases can be hacked. And I know that your refrain is usually biology is complex, yeah. <laughs> right? So in your view, what is the optimistic scenario I mean, to chronic diseases, chronic illnesses generally? Yeah. You know, Alzheimer's is a perfect example because when I started in the industry, that's the disease I worked on. I worked on schizophrenia and Alzheimer's. And if you had told me back in like 1991, 30 years ago, if you told me that it would be 2021 and we would still be arguing about whether the amyloid protein is the cause of Alzheimer's, I would have been very, very upset <laughs> because I would have thought, my God, it's been 30 years. You still haven't figured this stuff out? This is terrible. And that's the thing. Biology really is complex. People get tired of hearing that excuse, but you hear it a lot because it's true. We don't know what causes Alzheimer's. We have been pouring billions and billions of dollars, tremendous amounts of effort into this disease for decades now. We still don't know what causes Alzheimer's. Now, cancer is a different thing because Alzheimer's is probably one disease. Cancer is probably about 10,000 diseases, all of which end up showing you the same thing, uncontrolled cell growth. But there are a lot of different ways to get into that uncontrolled cell growth, and that's what we're finding. Even if you take one tumor in a person, sample it with a needle, and pick out different cells, you find that even what looks like one tumor actually has a dozen, 20, 50, 100 different kinds of tumor cells fighting it out with each other, which is why when you do chemotherapy, you can often shrink 
cancer a bit, and then it comes back. You've killed off the cells that you can kill off, but there are a lot more inside the same cancer that don't respond, and now you've just made life easier for them. You killed off all their competition. So that's another complication. So again, there's no reason why we can't eventually cure these things, but the biology has just been like peeling a huge onion. Every time you think you're getting there, there's another layer and another layer and another layer. But everything we learn, we get to keep. That's one of the things I like most about science. We really do learn things. We know a lot more about Alzheimer's than we did 30 years ago, but it's not enough yet. Speaking of learning things, I know critics or skeptics may want to say otherwise, but we have seen a lot of innovation in drugs research. Yeah. So my question to you is, what delivers that innovation? Like, what is the right mix of institutional safety guidelines and the risks that researchers are allowed to take? Because a lot of institutions complain about the IRBs of their local university. Uh, some people say bioethicists are holding things back with their mm. pesky little philosophical objections. You know, and so many other things. Some would, of course, put it at the foot of the regulator itself, like the FDA and so many. So how do you get it right in order for you oh, to be yeah. able to deliver innovation in drugs and pharmaceutical research? Yeah, that's a that's a really tough question because you're right. It is a constant battle between going faster and hold it, hold it, hold it. Let's make sure about this. I think that we have more new and different things going right now in drug discovery than we have ever had in my career anyway. We have a lot of things, different kinds of cell therapies, targeted protein degradation is a fancy one that's going right now, a lot of gene therapies, CRISPR and these other, there's so many more than I can even have time to list, and they're all hitting at once. It's never been like this in my career since 89. So I'm really happy about that. At the same time, not all of these things are going to work. Some of them are going to crash and burn. And we've had attempts at some of these things before. Some of the first attempts at gene therapy killed people. Jesse Gelsinger is the name of the first person that was killed by gene therapy because things just totally went wrong and we didn't know what happened. A few years ago, a little company in Germany had a new immune system drug that they were going to try. The company is called Tejanero. And they lined up about six or eight people to be the first people in the world to actually get the injections of this drug. They'd done all their animal studies and looked at monkeys and all sorts of stuff. They gave it to these people about 15 minutes apart. And by the time they finished dosing the last person in line, the first one stood up, screamed, grabbed their head and collapsed on the floor. 15 minutes later, the second person screamed and collapsed on the floor. 15 minutes, you see where this is going. Mm -hmm. They set off a terrible immune reaction in these people. No one got killed, but they just barely were able to keep them alive. No one saw this coming. It didn't happen in the animals at all. So this was a horrible shock. So you see that if you go full speed ahead and say, all right, I don't care about your review boards. I don't care about your bioethics. We're just going to get out and try stuff. You're going to cause serious damage because the stuff we're working with really is powerful. It has to be powerful to stop some of these diseases. On the other hand, you can screw up in the other direction. You can say, oh, no, 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 no. These things are too powerful. We have to be very, very slow and cautious. Then you'll never get anywhere. So I think that we're roughly in the right zone with that. But every so often we go too fast and every so often we go too slow. Uh, uh, do you think we've gotten to a point where we now know enough about the science of drug discovery and research not to take so many risks or some kinds of risks. There was the case of the Chinese researcher with the HIV AIDS uh, situation. There were also some people who were strongly arguing for virulation, deliberately infecting people with the COVID virus and that I was going to deliver vaccines and other kinds of treatment a lot faster. But do you think we've gotten to a point with the science that we really don't need to take some kind of risks anymore mm -hmm. to get things done? You know, 
I wish I could say that we have, but I don't think we're there yet. We still get surprised all the time. We get surprised sometimes when things work even better than we thought, but more often we get surprised when things don't work at all. And sometimes it's because they not only don't work, they cause actual harm. A few years back, Pfizer, you know, famous now with their vaccine, Pfizer was working on a cardiovascular drug that was going to raise HDL, the good cholesterol. They already were selling Lipitor to lower the bad cholesterol. So they were going to have one to raise the good and lower the bad. And it was just going to be great. This was their biggest drug discovery effort ever. They were dosing thousands and thousands of people with this drug. And then one Sunday morning, they called Pfizer's head of research and got him out of the shower to tell him that the monitoring committee had looked at the data and the people who were getting this new Pfizer drug were actually dying at a slightly faster rate than the people who weren't. And wow. they were dying of cardiovascular disease. They were dying of heart attacks and stroke. So this drug that was supposed to actually prevent this was making it slightly worse. We still don't know why. Eli Lilly had an Alzheimer's drug not too long ago, which when they finally ran the full date on it, they dosed it for like three or four years and they found that they were definitely making people worse with Alzheimer's. Here's a drug that's supposed to be maybe not a cure, but at least slow it down. It was actually speeding it up. We still don't know why. Ah, this sort of stuff just keeps happening to us. Human biology is full of unknowns. So we're going to have to run these trials and cross our fingers and look at all the data for some time to come. If you try to speed it up, I think you're just going to end up possibly hurting more people. Obviously, with the pandemic, especially the supply issues that we have experienced with the deployment of the vaccines, where some countries are not getting enough due to the scale of the manufacturing. There's been so many talk about countries developing their own local drugs mm. discovery research industry. And one of the things that genuinely puzzled me as a person, and sometimes when I speak to policymakers, is that how do you know what works? Yes. Is it funding? We hear every day, I mean, there was a case of CureVac and so many other companies that had vaccine candidates that failed. They also mm -hmm. had talent and funding, right? Yes. So for people who are interested and motivated to throw money at this, you have been in the industry for three decades. What works? What are yeah. the things that work? Yeah. Oh, I wish I had the magic answer to give you, but you make some really good points there. One of the things that I think helps is if you have a bunch of people working at different companies and a bunch of people who are also providing funding for this, like venture capital for startup companies, and a bunch of people in universities who have been doing this and getting some experience in it. That's why, you know, I, I live around the Boston area. Boston, Cambridge is basically the biggest biopharma hub in the United States now. It's been growing over the last 20 years, and it really is the biggest now. Second biggest would be out around San Francisco and the Bay Area, then maybe San Diego and some others. But one of the key things is that you have a lot of experienced people who can evaluate a new company or new idea and decide, you know, this is probably worth some money. We can find some people who like to invest in these things, who know the risks and are willing to put money into it. If you're trying to do that somewhere where people don't know the risk, if you're trying to do this, well, you know, I'm not even talking about other countries. If you try to do this in the U.S., but you decide to do it in, I don't know, San Antonio or Miami or maybe um, Pittsburgh, you know, you pick some other cities in the U.S., they don't have a history of biopharma incubators and startups and venture capital people. They're not as experienced, so it's harder for them to judge. And there's not as much money pouring into the area. So it sort of keeps itself running. There are so many biotech companies around here in the Boston, Cambridge area that brings in people to work on them. And it means if one company blows up and runs out of money, the people there have a good chance of finding a job at another company. I know a guy who's been working at like three or four companies now, and he's always kept the same parking spot. <laughs> you know, he could just find another one. The venture capital people 
our experience. They know that not all these companies are going to work, but that some of them are, and they have the patients. And if a company just completely wipes out, they take their drug into animal trials and it does nothing, they don't panic. They're like, okay, this happens. Good thing we have six or eight or 10 more things coming along because some of those are going to fail. So if you're trying to start this from scratch, and people try to do that here in the U.S. too, they'll say, okay, we want to have a great biomedical center of excellence here in Birmingham, Alabama, or Fort Worth, Texas, or Phoenix, Arizona. We want to be a big biotech center of excellence. No one's been able to start one of these things from scratch. It sort of just has to grow over the years. And if we knew how to make another Boston Cambridge or another Silicon Valley, if we had the secret to making those things, we would have a lot more of them. The world would have a lot more of them. But I don't quite know if it's just an accident and these things just kind of start growing or if there is some magic mixture. You do have to have good universities. You have to have several people who are willing to start companies and willing to fail and people who are willing to give them money again, even if they fail. Start with that. But that's not enough. People sometimes question the, should I say, incentive or the motives of drugs companies, uh, sure. the, the phrase Big Pharma has all kinds of negative associations. Oh, yeah. And yeah, to be fair, companies are taking a lot of risks and spending a lot of money into a lot of this research. And I think it's right for whatever keeps that system going to continue because, I mean, it's good for humanity. But what's the insider view? you know, from you on issues like the cost of drugs and yeah. some companies uh, deliberately do not want to cure some diseases so that they can keep feeding mm -hmm. prophylactics, you know, and things like that without, uh, I mean, we can ignore the crazy conspiracy stuff, yeah. you know. Yeah, I've heard that last one a lot over the years. And if anyone tries that one on me, they, they get they get an earful from me because I've had people tell me, well, you guys don't actually want to cure cancer. You just want to keep selling cancer drugs. And then I start listing off the friends and coworkers that I've had in the drug industry who have died of cancer. Or they say, well, you guys, you know, you just want to sell things, you know, to Alzheimer's patients. You don't want to cure it. And I tell them, okay, what about all these people who've been working for 20, 30, 40 years trying to find a cure? Were they just pretending? Or did no one tell them that they weren't in on the joke? No, people in the drug industry die of these diseases too. We really do. As I say, I've had friends and coworkers who, who have had all these things. My own family, I've had you know close, close relatives die of these things. And it's terrible because sometimes they have died of diseases that I have been working on in the lab because I've worked on a lot of different diseases over the last 30 years. Um, I mentioned Alzheimer's. I worked on diabetes, osteoporosis, viral, bacterial diseases, all kinds of cancer. I've had close friends and relatives die of these things while I'm working on the lab. And I look at them and I think, I don't have anything for you yet. I don't have anything at all. None of us do. So it's really tough to do that. But at the same time, you keep going because you think if we keep at it, maybe we can find something and somebody else's brother somebody else's friend or boss or sister or wife, maybe we can save them. So at the same time, you're right. The drug industry has a bad reputation. A lot of drugs cost too much, I think. One of the reasons they cost a lot, though, is because we fail so often. I tell people the biggest single fact about the drug industry is when we actually manage to get a compound into humans, into human clinical trials, most projects don't make it into human clinical trials, by the way. Most of them wipe out even before that. But when they finally do, the failure rate is about 90%, which is insane. I mean, think about it. 90% of Toyota's cars, their engines will start and they will roll down the street. 90% of McDonald's hamburgers are probably okay to eat. 90% of Boeing's airplanes will get off the ground, but 90% of our drugs fail. So the whole thing about the industry is they're trying to make up for all those failures and all that money, because when you finally find something that works, you try to make the most money you possibly can out of it. And that's why everyone hates us. 
I understand mm. it. <laughs> is aging, I should ask you this, is aging such an important problem for humanity to solve? Why, oh, why yeah. are we investing so much money into that research? You know, there's not as much going in there as you think. It gets a lot of publicity, but if you compare it to the amount of money that's going into things like cancer or diabetes or others, it's not as much. The feeling, though, is that countries around the world, as the world has gotten more affluent, the average age of the populations is going up. Now, you have some here way out in front, like Japan. Japan's entire population distribution is inverting to where mm -hmm. they're going to have more people over 70 than they do under 20. Yep. And we've never had human populations like that. This is what happens when you are a very well-off, quiet country, is this can actually happen. But we don't know what it's going to be like. So if there's some way to make aging be less of a burden on the healthcare system and on people in general, if maybe people could be a little more mobile or spend less time in the hospital or get sick less often, it would actually help countries' economies out a lot. Maybe they could even be productive further on and not, you know, not end up bedridden. But if you want extra long life, you have to be very careful. You may know about the Greek myth where um, one of the characters asked the god Apollo. She said she wanted to live forever. And Apollo said, sure, you got it. You're going to live forever. <laughs> she forgot to ask that she would never grow old. Mm -hmm. That was the Cumaean Sibyl in the story. And there's a Roman work where someone says that he actually got in the novel, he says that he got to meet the Cumaean Sibyl. By that time, she lived in a tiny jar because she was so old, she'd shrunken so small, the myth has it. She was living in a jar and he asked her, what do you want? And she says, I want to die. <laughs> so if someone offers you an extra 25 years of life, is that an extra 25 years of feeling like you're 25? Or is that an extra 25 years of being 95? You better check into that before you accept the offer. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a great refrain, because one other thing that came to my mind as you were talking about that is, is the pension system of some countries. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, How is that so, going to work? Yeah, <laughs> and so many other retirement benefits that people yeah. will How start is that collecting. Going to work? Because these pension systems, like U.S. Social Security and so many other countries, were set up when there were a few old people and a bunch of young people working. What happens when it's mostly old people drawing pensions and there's not so many young people working? Huh, good question. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you've been communicating science for 20 years, like we were discussing earlier. Mm -hmm. And every now and then, as we saw with COVID-19, there is always a wave of miscommunication, conspiracy theories about pharmaceuticals, about medicine, about medicine drugs. Yeah. yeah. So what has your experience been in educating the public about science? In this case, very complicated science. What works? And yeah. then what is failing us at the moment? Why are people still persuaded by some of these crazy yeah. tales and, and, and stories? Uh, that's, that's a good question. That's a really tough question. All I can say is there are people who are persuadable or willing to learn, and there are other people who are not. One of my favorite sayings, and I didn't come up with it, it goes back at least to Jonathan Swift, but one of my favorite sayings is you can't use reason to talk someone out of a position that they didn't get to by reason. It's the wrong tool for the job. It's like trying to pull a screw out with a claw hammer. It's just the wrong thing to use. For example, look at vaccines. Even before COVID, we had a lot of vaccine skeptics, people who are like, you know, I don't want my baby to get these vaccines, you know, because they're afraid of, oh, God knows, autism, all this crazy stuff, which yep. is not, autism is real, but vaccines don't cause it. And I read an article a few years ago that really sort of changed my thinking about this, because when I would meet someone like this, I would try to persuade them with evidence and medical knowledge and reason. And that's not the tool, because for many people, when they are terrified about giving their children vaccines, it's more of a emotional and physical response. They look at their baby and they say, here's my baby, this new life in the world. She's perfect. Look at her. 
isn't this wonderful, this miracle I'm holding in my hands? And this person over here wants to stick something inside them full of God knows what. I don't know what's in this stuff. And they say it's going to change her forever. She's never going to be the same after getting this vaccine. Mm. To them, this is more like contamination, defilement. You're smearing this innocent, pure baby with this horrible lab dirt, and they're never going to be clean again after that, and you can't take it back. So this is more like, as I say, a feeling of, of disgust, which is not something that we use logic and reason to get around very well. And I think that's where some of the anti-vaccine stuff comes from. And some of it, of course, is also coming from sheer politics. People are like, I'm tired of being told what to do. I'm tired of these people who think they know better than me coming around and telling me what I'm supposed to be eating, what I'm supposed to be thinking about, how I'm supposed to be acting. The hell with all of you. And that's not something that you can reason someone out of either. So we've got several things happening. There are people who are honestly worried and curious and are willing to look at evidence and say, OK, that's not as bad as I thought. Or, OK, I looked at that. I understand it, but I'm still not quite persuaded. And there are other people who are pissed off or extremely afraid. And nothing you say to them is going to change their mind. Mm -hmm. I find that so poignant because one of the things that, and I know you've also talked about this on your blog down the years, is yeah. the naturalistic, or should I say the popularization of natural remedies. You know, oh, yes. Things, and this perception that anything that is made or cultured in a lab is somehow yeah. unnatural or impure, yeah. you know. How much would you say that the herbal industry, so to speak, is influencing yeah. things? I think they are, but I think it's also the reason there's such a big herbal and natural remedy industry is because there's a huge market for it. Mm -hmm. It didn't come from nowhere. People, you're right, people want to think this way. And it seems to be really deep in human nature because you think of, oh, remember back or have you heard about back in the simpler times when things were pure, things were clean, things were natural. It wasn't so complicated and messed up like it is now. Every civilization has this myth of the golden age, way back when, when things were so much better and simpler and cleaner and more pure. So I think it's something we've got deep inside the human brain that makes us think like this. And of course, life is kind of complicated and messy right now, by contrast. So people feel that a natural remedy is somehow better, somehow the right thing to do. And taking something that came out of a big laboratory made by people who look like me is maybe uh, way too risky. But this whole naturalistic fallacy, I mean, cobra venom is all natural. Strychnine is all natural. Tetanus, completely natural. Polio, as natural as can be. The natural world doesn't care about us as humans. We're not the center of the universe. Animals, bacteria, plants are all out there right now fighting it out with each other, using chemical warfare on each other to try to get an edge. The antibiotics that we use are mostly from bacteria trying to kill off other bacteria. So, it's really a, a constant fight out there. And if you look out and see a beautiful, green, peaceful field of flowers and you say, why wouldn't you take this wonderful natural remedy from this beautiful field that's uncontaminated by industry? Well, if you pick the beautiful flower over there, which is called monk's hood, beautiful purple. We've got one just about to bloom out there right now. If you pick that beautiful flower, it will kill you all natural. You talked about CRISPR earlier. One other area that people have expressed some kind of uh, scare stories about yeah. is genetic engineering. Yes. You know, and the <clears throat> prospects of what we can do with that technology. And innovation and research is proceeding apace in that yeah. area. So how realistic are some of the fears and yeah. uh, what are their promises in real human terms? 
Yeah, the promises are huge because we know about a lot of diseases where we can pin down a genetic cause. Cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease, we're getting closer on things like Parkinson's and others. We know a lot of diseases that are inborn genetic errors, sickle cell anemia, thalassemia. There are so many of these things. A lot of rare diseases fall in this category, and right now we can't do anything for it. So the promise is huge because we know what would need to be fixed. Huntington's disease, there is one gene that makes one protein. And if you could just fix that where it makes the right kind of protein instead of the wrong kind, that person will not have Huntington's anymore. Instead of dying when they're in their 20s of an uncontrollable wasting disease, they'll live a whole life. That's a lot of promise. But on the other hand, human genetics is hideously complicated. When this fellow in China a few years ago engineered a cup of human babies with CRISPR, I was extremely angry and upset. It is too early to engineer human babies with CRISPR right now. We're still getting these tools to work right. We're still trying to make sure they do what we think they do. And if you're going to use it, you have to go in and pick a target that we have worked out very, very, very well, like sickle cell. We've known about the genetic cause of sickle cell anemia since the 1940s. It was the very first genetic disease ever identified. That's the place you want to try it out. You don't want to go off like some wild white coat cowboy like the fella in China and just start messing with human embryos because you could do terrible things. When he engineered those children with CRISPR, he actually did a lot of other things to their chromosomes that he didn't even realize. When they later sequenced them, they're like, okay, you actually changed this and you took that out and you deleted that. No one saw any of this coming. We've got a long way to go before we can just go around CRISPRing everyone. But at the same time, we need to keep trying to figure out how to do it because we'll be able to do amazing things once we know how. Finally, what is the one idea? Uh, this is a bit of a tradition on the show. What's <laughs> the one idea that you are really excited about? It may be something you're working on, it may be something other people mm -hmm. are working on. Maybe something you really admire that yeah. you really like to see spread everywhere. You like to see more people know about it, get excited about it, think about it, or yeah. get funded more. What, what is that idea? Yeah. There, I mentioned earlier that there are a lot of really neat ideas going on right now in drug discovery, so it's very hard for me to pick. But if I just pick one off the top of my head, there's a thing where we're taking T cells, these immune system cells, and we're learning slowly, with a lot of fits and starts, we're learning how to make them target cells that we want to target. For instance, right now, there are some kinds of leukemia that we can actually turn these T cells against. The first person that they ever did it to was a few years ago in Pennsylvania, and people have been trying to do this for years. I mean, these immune system cells, they look at cancer cells and they say, oh, that's one of us. That's, that's, you know, that's part of the body. We're not touching that. So people tried for years and years to get them to attack cancer cells. They finally figured out a way to do it with some of these leukemia cells. The first person they did it to, they took a bunch of his bone marrow, genetically engineered it, and injected a whole bunch more of these stem cells into his body to make leukemia-fighting T cells. Nothing happened to him for the first few days. Then he started to feel bad. Then he started to feel worse. Then he ended up in the emergency room and the ICU and almost died because they put so much of this into him, it was killing off all the leukemia at once and it almost shut down his kidneys. He probably lost three or four pounds of leukemia cells from his blood in a period wow. of a few days. It nearly killed him, but they kept him going. And when he woke up from it, he did not have leukemia. This man was about two weeks from dying. He had gone through every kind of chemotherapy. Nothing was left. They had told him, get your affairs in order. I hope you have a will. And we pulled him out of a coffin by doing this engineered T cell thing. Other people have had it happen too. So I'm very excited about learning how to control these T cells. Now they're terrifying because if you point them at the wrong thing, instead of eating five pounds of cancer out of you, it might turn around and destroy your kidneys and you'll die. So we have to make very sure we know what we're doing. But the immune system has such incredible power, and we're just finally getting to where we can learn to use it. 
So this is a big field, and I'm very excited about where it's going. Final question, Derek. If I sure. were a young, if I were a young man, maybe in my early 20s, okay. getting into pharmaceutical research yeah. today, what would you tell me from what you have learned over the years? Oh yeah, I, I actually had the chance to do this because I go and speak at a lot of universities, and I tell them, don't expect to find a wonder drug. I've been working in this business, as I say, for over 30 years. I have never once worked on a drug that has been sold in a pharmacy. Never once. So if you value your work and yourself and your life over whether or not you've made a drug that's in the drugstore, you're going to be very unhappy. What you have to do is you have to work as hard as you can, think as hard as you can, come up with things that no one has found before and no one has understood before and be happy with that. Because whether or not you make a drug is not in your own hands. It's going to take hundreds and hundreds of other people who know things you don't. And it's also going to take sheer luck when you give it to the animals and you give it to the cells because we don't understand why most of our things fail. So don't get upset about things that are not in your control. But if you like doing this sort of thing, if you like finding out things that nobody knew about, if you like being surprised all the time, good surprises, bad surprises, I couldn't do a job where I knew what was going to happen anymore. I'm, I'm not fit for that kind of work. I <laughs> want to have strange, weird things happening. If you like that, there's nothing else that will make you happy. So I'm just glad that I've been able to do it. And I tell people, if you think you have that kind of personality, then go for it. Thank you so much, Derek. It's been amazing talking to you. Oh, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. You had really good questions. If you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to the show on any of your favorite podcast vendors. That may be Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or any of the rest. Don't forget to rate us on your platform. It helps others find the show. Or you can just listen or download on our website, www.ideasuntrapped.com. Mm-hmm.